How do we get ourselves out of this? What exactly is the path out of lockdown? Australia appears to be doing well, flattening the curve, but that leaves us facing some tough decisions about what to do next, balancing public health and the economy. Can we get Australia moving again without risking a spike in infection rates? Whatever we do, it seems, someone will pay the price. We're ready for you to join this conversation from home, wherever that is. You've got lots of questions. Now let's get you some answers. Welcome to Q&A. Hi there, welcome to the program. Joining us tonight, she represents 1.8 million workers nationwide, ACTU Secretary Sally McManus. He's a former mining executive chosen by the Prime Minister to lead the National COVID Commission, Nev Power. Economist Gigi Foster, who's calling for businesses to reopen as soon as possible. Epidemiologist Jodie McVernon, she's been delivering the COVID-19 modelling to government, informing the big decisions. And ethicist Simon Longstaff, who's weighing up the moral dilemmas that we all face. And later in the program, as the nation prepares to mark Anzac Day, we'll talk to a 95-year-old former prisoner of war to hear how he thinks Australia is handling these tough times. To fight over a packet of toilet rolls? For God's sake, let's get real. Well, we will get real later when we meet uh, Jim Kerr. Remember, you can always stream us on iView, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter and the Gram. Quanda is the hashtag if you want to play along tonight at home. Let's start with our first question from Seamus Tanner in Greenslopes, Queensland. In Australia, the median age of hospitalised COVID-19 cases is 59.5 years old and the median age of death from COVID-19 is 80 years old. Meanwhile, young people who mostly experience mild or no symptoms are set to experience a much higher rate of unemployment than older people due to often being casual workers in the hardest hit industries such as hospitality and retail. We are also the ones who are going to shoulder the government's debt burden for decades to come. My question is, as a young person, how am I supposed to accept bearing the brunt of an economic crisis caused by a health crisis that in theory affects us very little? And what should the government do to better ease the burden on young people in particular? Gigi Foster. I couldn't have said it better myself. He's absolutely right. This is a massive cost shift um, and we are going to see the burden not just today but in future years on primarily the younger people and I will say the poorer, more disadvantaged people in our communities. Why does this economic situation hit younger people more than older people? Well, first of all, they are more likely to be in casual work, as your questioner said. They are also in schooling, uh, which of course, as we know, is very disrupted now with online learning, replacing face-to-face -face instruction, both at schools and at universities. And they're going to be living with the effects of what's happening right now for a longer number of years. So they're going to feel that burden and that, that catch-up will take um, probably a decade, if in, not more. In terms of wages? In terms of wages, in terms of training, in terms of how good they are at what they do, in terms of the education quality they're getting and advancement in general in their, in their workplaces, whether it's wages or status or anything else. So, Sally McManus, do you think it's just younger people that are bearing the brunt or do you think it's spread more evenly? It's not just younger people, but I do have a lot of sympathy for what Seamus was saying. Um, first of all, the younger generation have already been the first generation since World War II to have their living standards go backwards. And that's because they're not able to get secure jobs because there's too many casual jobs, not able to buy um, houses. The, you know, their education now costs them a lot as well. So it makes me think um, going through such a big thing like this, maybe we should be looking at an intergenerational compact or... Mm. Um, paying back to those young people and giving them some basic guarantees, guarantees around good, secure jobs, guarantees around quality education as part of the payback of society to the next generation. Is there, Simon Longstaff, a moral obligation here for older generations in Australian society who are, in effect, helped or even saved by these decisions we've taken to actually assist the younger people who are it sounds like, paying the price. In part, but I don't think it's just as simple as that. I'm sympathetic too to what Seamus 
has to say, but I think there's also a risk of false equivalences in some of these arguments between the economy on one hand and lives on the other. Uh, Seamus and his generation are not just affected by economic consequences. They too could become complicit if different decisions were made in some of the terrible outcomes that we seem to have escaped but might have befallen many people in Australia. Much harder than just on older people but across the board. And if you think about someone like Seamus and say, does he want to really be the inheritor of those decisions? The answer is no, he wouldn't. Uh, I've got children the same sort of age and I know that yes, they're concerned about economic issues, but also they want to be part of a society that does care about older people and those who've got a susceptibility to this disease. Having said that, whilst we don't have any control over the disease and it's spread in, at the moment, there's certainly there's no vaccine, we do have control over the economic response. There are all sorts of levers that could be pulled and Sally has talked about those, I'm sure Gigi has in mind and the others here as well, where you could rebalance things so that it is fairer for that generation. I think that's what we should be thinking about and there is an obligation therefore to take account of their predicament. So Nev Power, is that what you're looking at in the Commission? Are you considering these questions? Well, I feel deeply Hamish for everyone that's been impacted by the coronavirus and particularly those that have lost their jobs through this and are suffering economically. But there's also a huge psychological uh, impact from the coronavirus as well. And uh, I, for one, believe that we should be protecting the most vulnerable in our society. We need to make the closures and put the restrictions on to prevent the spread of the virus and then do everything we can within that to maximise the number of people in jobs, to maximise the amount of business activity and minimise the impact on our economy. So I don't think it's about choosing one or the other and I don't think as a society we should ever turn our back on the most vulnerable. We should be protecting them and we should be doing everything that we can um, now and into the future to rebound our economy as quickly as we can. I don't think that anybody is saying we should abandon the old people. In fact, I think that that's been one of the most consistent messages that we've seen from responses around the world, and I even said it on my radio program a few weeks ago, we should be quarantining the older people to the extent we can, voluntarily, of course, you don't force somebody in our society to do something, ideally, but so if somebody wants to hug their grandchild, fine, but people in nursing homes who can be quarantined, yes, we should protect them. That that doesn't mean that, you know, we shouldn't be thinking as well about other human welfare costs. And I reject the idea that it's lives versus the economy. It's lives versus lives. The economy is about lives. It's about protection of lives and human welfare and livelihoods. Yes, and it, you yes. can make an apples to apples comparison, although people find it to be awkward to do so. Well, I think though, Gigi, that uh, it's often presented as if it's not just about lives versus lives. And and I think the difference in this case is that the people who are susceptible to the disease, there's nothing much you can do about them if they have the infection and are susceptible to its effects. Whereas there are so many more things we can do to address the economic consequences on people's lives. And of course, even there, it's not just about economic, it's just again, it's not the economy. I take it, uh, incidents of mental health uh, from isolation. There's many things which are human factors beyond those that... But it is also true that there's a huge tug of war going on around the world between, on one hand, the Donald Trumps of this world and maybe you could say, on the other hand, the Jacinda Ardern's. They've got very different approaches to both um, the health impacts and the economic impacts. And I feel in that, this country that we've been pulled one way, then we've come back another way because the health experts have taken us there. But that struggle is still happening and it's still going to occur. So I think it's good to get that, this out in the open and know that this is some yeah. of the discussions that are going to happen over the next month or so. Our next question tonight is from Anthea, Anthea Markoviak in Tarthrit, New South Wales. We have put a large part of our planet into an induced coma in order to save possibly 4%, many of them elderly and sick, of an incredibly overpopulated planet. My question is, will it be worth it? And do we need to have a more pragmatic attitude to death? Jody McVernon. Look, I've been listening to all of this and I think in Australia, what we really don't appreciate is what we have been spared. We have not lived in a situation where we've used ice rinks as makeshift morgues or refrigerated trucks outside, you know, hospitals. And, and these are things that are happening in other high-income countries. So I think it's far too simplistic to say we're taking all these measures to save older people's lives. We've seen um, a, a very 
large number of cases in people across the age spectrum. We've seen severe cases and deaths in people across the age spectrum. And we've seen whole health systems, you know, really struggle to cope, not just with COVID, but with other health conditions when this disease is allowed to run rampant. So there are very many health impacts across the age range of having an uncontrolled COVID epidemic. And we need to really take that into account rather than, than think of this as a simplistic age trade-off in, in the sorts of harms that we're trying to prevent. The, the criticism, Jody McVernon, that is levelled, though, is that we've made these decisions to effectively shut a lot of the economy down based on modelling that showed that by around about now, our hospitals would be at capacity, the ICU wards would be over capacity. I mean, was the modelling so wrong? So we've averted or... that. No, we've averted that. And that's the thing. You know, our government listened to these predictions at a time when many others didn't. And that's why Australia has not had to go through that. And now we're in a, on the life raft, as we say. We're at a point where we're in control of the situation and there is time for this complex societal discussion. And I completely welcome that. I think as public health practitioners and as the health experts, we, we helped Australia avoid that crisis. But, yes, we all agree that now to work our way through this needs a much more balanced and nuanced conversation about who we are, about what we value, about how we protect all of our health needs and about how we, we um, open up and protect our economy and future society. All of those things need to be, to be balanced and measured, but it's not an all-or-nothing situation. Uh, Jodie, your team, you lead the team that, that provides this modelling to government, it's been relied on throughout this. Has this question of lives versus lives been considered in the big decisions that have been made here? So the modelling that we've done has really been about the COVID epidemic and we haven't um, been addressing other causes of life lost. So that clearly was not um, part of the modelling that's been done. We're not e economic modellers, we're not... Um, you know, looking at other health impacts and we're all aware of the adverse health impacts of lockdown and the adverse health impacts long term of an economic downturn. But now having got to a point of stability, we're in a position to be able to navigate our way through those next challenges with a measure of control. Gigi Foster, I can see you raising your eyes there. What frustrates me about this is when people talk about the economic costs of the lockdown, they often don't think in detail in terms of counting lives, as we do with the epidemiological models, for example. So has anyone here actually thought about how would you get a measure of the traded, traded lives when we lock an economy down? What are we sacrificing in terms of lives? Economists have tried to do that, and we try to do it in currencies like the value of a statistical life or the quality-adjusted life year yeah. or the well-being, the well-being year. And those, those quantities enable you to think about lives on one side versus lives on the other. And, I mean, if you do that kind of calculus, you realise very quickly that even with a very, very extreme epidemic in Australia, we are still potentially better off not having an economic lockdown in the first place because of the incredible effects that you see, not just in a short run way, but in many, many years to come. How can you say that? How can you say that? Like we're avoiding what's happened in the UK, what's happening in the US, the idea of having our ICUs overrun, our healthcare workers dying as well, is just the most horrible thought. It's like... horrible. It's horrible either way. The coronavirus has made the world awful. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt about that. But to, in order to have a proper discussion about trade-offs, you need to think in terms of lives that you're giving up. And I know it's invisible lives and it's difficult to imagine that when we aggregate, for example, all of the health effects, all of the mental health effects, all of the effects of people right now who have illnesses other than COVID-19. But, but Gigi, I don't accept the premise of the argument you're putting, mm -hmm. that this is simply two things where they're fixed in their response. I mean, I'd ask you, I, I, I'm not an economist, but if I said to you, look, we have had the lockdown mm -hmm. and we now want to put in place economic measures and other social measures to minimise the other lives that might be affected. Mm -hmm. I imagine you'd come up and you'd say, well, if we were to do these things... So you, you have to take the lockdown as the starting point, but if we did these things, they would have a very positive effect in minimising the very concerns you're about. And I'm wondering, what sort of policies would they look like? Are they the sorts of things that Sally's describing or Nev has in mind? So I definitely think the lockdown itself now that we are in this stage, right, we've already caused much suffering. We've already caused many lives. So how do we, off we, how, how do we offset that? 
it's very difficult. I mean, a functioning economy delivers welfare, you know, the best of, of any system that we've ever come up with as a human species. So Jeannie, to, to have to, to, to address that by going in and having stimulus packages, of course, it's much better than if we didn't have those stimulus packages. I completely agree. The JobKeeper program is fabulous. I love that. Those were not actually on the table when we first started talking about lockdowns. Nip Power's trying to get in. Yes, yeah, sorry, uh, Gigi. One point that I'd like to make is that the way that uh, the virus has been managed in Australia is probably going to get us back into easing the restrictions and getting our economy back uh, quicker than if we had let it get out of control. Because if we look at countries where that hasn't occurred, then the impact on their economy has been even far more dramatic. So I don't think that there's a solution here that says it's one or the other. It's much more nuanced to that. And protecting people and keeping people out of hospitals will allow us to ease the restrictions much more quickly than if it had run rampant. Well, I think it's much too early to be able to tell for sure what the full economic impact is going to be of what we have done to ourselves, because this is not going to be a V-shaped recovery. Recoveries don't come in V-shapes. We have destroyed network links. We have you know, severed our overseas trading links uh, in large in a lot of cases in many industries. Now, some of these JobKeeper program type uh, payments and, and programs will allow us to retain some of those links so that the employers and employees don't have to reform. Um, but that process of reforming and getting the economy geared up again, that takes a lot of time. So uh, we're not going to see the full economic impacts for at least a year or more. But we've got time. We don't have what could have been 10,000 lives. Like, that, that's the difference. Again, have you done the calculus on the other side of the equation? Are you talking about lost opportunity? Or I'm you... talking about lost lives. I'm talking about quality adjusted life years, which is the normal yeah. currency that people use when they're making decisions in developed countries about how much to spend on saving people's lives. Because we always have to allocate resources. We don't like to think about this, but it happens all the time, every day in a health ministry in a developed country, there has to be a choice about how to allocate your scarce resources, how much towards cancer research, how much towards you know this, that, and the other different disability and illness that can affect people all throughout their lives. And when those decisions are made, when the pharmaceutical benefits scheme decides what drugs to take on, it's okay. using qualies. Let me take our next question. It's from Lee Shi Su in Mill Park, Victoria. Good evening. There appears to be much cause for optimism as our COVID-19 curve seems to flatten. Yet we would be foolish to think viruses can be completely eliminated or suppressed. As countries such as Singapore have discovered, the comeback COVID kit can strike hard when our guard is lowered. Australia is in a bit of a bind, as whilst it appears we are getting on top of the situation, winter is coming. In other words, it's the flu season. Is this prospect enough to give pause to relaxing present restrictions? Jody McVernon. So that's an excellent question, and it's one that we are all asking as we try to understand more about how this virus operates. Something that's very interesting is that many of the Mekong countries have actually been relatively spared in terms of case numbers and deaths, and we're interested to know how much of that is about climate. And obviously, coming into winter, we're more concerned that the virus might be more transmissible. And so this is why, in the relaxation of measures, caution is essential. And we're talking about, you know, a staged relaxation and a careful monitoring of growth rates and a careful observation of, of case numbers and anticipated case numbers to be sure that we don't end up with a virus that might be more contagious at this point in time than it, than it was um, a couple of months ago. So... It's an excellent question and we, we encourage caution for that reason. But Mr Lee referred to Singapore. It's recorded uh, its largest jump to date today. Yep. 1,426 yep. new cases. Uh, and most of those are migrant workers living Indeed. in dormitories. Uh, how... Indeed. So we heard earlier how the most vulnerable in our population were going to suffer more from economic cutbacks, but we also see that this virus exposes inequalities in society and people who are in poor quality housing or crowded conditions are also vulnerable. So we must remember them on both sides of this equation. Is that an issue here in Australia, Jody? People in crowded spaces, people uh, detained possibly? 
Indeed. So we also have to be alert to that, that people who are in detention or in prisons or in other environments, it's part of the vulnerability of people in residential aged care facilities, that there are large numbers of people who are vulnerable together. And in all of these circumstances, we're doing our best to prevent introduction of the virus. That's a lot harder when it's um, circulating freely in the community. And we've seen that in other countries where there is uncontrolled community transmission, that it's almost impossible to keep the virus out of these settings. All right. And Obviously, we're very alert to Northern Australia. At the moment, there are terrible outbreaks going on in the Navajo Nation in the US, and we would love to avert those types of outbreaks. All right. To this point, we, our next question tonight comes from Farhad Bandesh, who's in the Mantra Hotel in Preston in Victoria. I and more than 60 other refugees have been in prison for seven years by the Australian government. We were transferred to Australia for medical help on the Medivac Bill nine months ago. We locked up at the Mantra Hotel uh, on the third floor. Every 24 hours there are around 60 staff changes. It is impossible to practice uh, social distancing. Uh, this puts us at the high risk uh, catching COVID-19. I asked the government, what are you going to do to make sure uh, COVID-19 cannot uh, spread to us and into the community? Uh, this is an urgent uh, public health issue. Why can't you release us into the community so we stay with our families, friends and be safe? Jody McVerner, I just want to understand precisely from you, are these individuals that are being held in a, a hotel in Melbourne a, a public health risk in the scenario that they're in? There's 60 of them, two to three to a room. Uh, some of them have been here up to nine months, Farhad says. He's been waiting for medical treatment. Uh, they're being kept in their rooms, he says, for up to 23 hours a day. Uh, and he hasn't seen fresh air in four weeks since the, uh, the COVID-19 restrictions have been put in place. So clearly this is a really complex and difficult situation and I really feel um, for all of these people. Um, in terms of the risk that is posed to them, um, obviously, people working in the hospitality industry have very clear guidelines in the hotel industry about how to maintain safe distancing practices, how to clean properly, how to take those appropriate hygiene measures, and in the same way that we're quarantining Australians returning from overseas in hotels on arrival. So in that particular environment, there will be measures put in place to reduce the risk of transmission of infection. But the wider issue of people in detention is a very difficult one. And in all of those environments, it's important to, to try to mitigate risk as far as possible. Simon Longstaff. Well, I think, despite, although we might disagree in the panel about the means that might be employed, what we're all saying is we're wanting to privilege the value of a human life. Uh, we just have difference about how best to do that. In this case, you have to also add in the factor that anybody who seeks asylum, the one obligation that you've got as a country when somebody seeks asylum is to offer them safety. And if you put people into a situation where you have reason to believe that they are unsafe because of the nature in which you're holding them, you're breaching the most fundamental obligation. Well, the, these guys, I say, this is effectively a, uh, a, an airport hotel and there's flight crews coming in and well, out of there well, all the, the time. This is the point. That if, if you think that the actual circumstances in which they find themselves makes them unsafe, and their life obviously matters as much as any other person's life in a case like this, then you need to adjust the circumstances. So the government may wish to keep them in detention uh, for reasons of policy and practice, but not in circumstances where they have a heightened risk of some kind of harm befalling them. And that's, that's the conundrum that the government, I think, needs to balance, is how do you honour the obligation of safety, respect their lives as much as we would any other person, and if there are other considerations they need to, where they can't be released, solve that problem and show how that can be done. Nev Power, what do you think should be done about these individuals? Well, Hamish, it's a little hard to understand the specifics of the case, but it does sound, as Simon said, that they're being put in harm's way. And if that's the case, that needs to be investigated and the circumstances changed so that they are not being exposed to greater risk. Um, I think we all know that the best protection against the spread of the coronavirus is to, uh, um, to maintain physical distancing and good hand hygiene and those things. So people coming in and out of a hotel shouldn't uh, pose a specific risk to them if that is maintained. But the particular circumstances, I think, needs to be looked into just to make sure uh, what is actually happening there. 
OK. Our next question tonight comes from Bernadette Highland Wood in St Lucia, Queensland. I'm doing my PhD in open government data, and I'm concerned about the potential for government overreach in collecting data. There have been many examples where government has misused personal data, especially against vulnerable populations. So why should we trust the Australian government and public health researchers with data collected from our personal mobile phones? Uh, Nib Power, how crucial are these apps to Australia getting moving again? Well, um, from a personal point of view, I think that anything that we can do to help limit the spread of the virus, but also to inform how quickly we can stamp on it when we do see flare-ups of it is vitally important. As we've talked about tonight, it is about protecting the most vulnerable in our community. And I'd, I'd say again, this is not just about old people. There are a lot of vulnerable people in our community and there are a lot of people in uh, close living quarters, in our Aboriginal communities, in remote areas, in nursing homes in, and other high density housing that we need to protect. So anything we can do to provide an edge against the virus, we should be doing. Can the Australian public trust the government, though, when it says, download this app, you've got nothing to worry about? I think there are genuine privacy concerns that need to be taken into account and people need to make their own decisions around that. But again, I can only listen to what the Health Minister has said today in that the app is purely there to identify people that after someone has had the virus that have been in close contact with them and that's an attempt to try and identify those people very quickly so that the uh, virus can be eliminated as quickly as possible. I think this does go to a deeper issue of trust in government and you see differences around the world about this. And Nev's right, if um, everyone downloaded that app, it'd make a big difference in terms of being able to trace um, people if they came in contact with the virus. And that'd be a great thing because that's one way we can um, make sure that we're not spreading it. But on the other hand, people don't trust the government. And in Australia, it's a, that's a big problem now. Um, not having... Would you, would you put this on your phone? Yeah, I've thought about this myself and I'll tell you something funny, as a union leader, and probably most union leaders just assume the government's spying on everything we're doing. So <laughs> our phones, our emails, everything. So um, You really assume that the government spies yeah, on you? Yeah, well, they do. They tap phones, they do all of those things. So for them to find out who I'm coming in contact on my Bluetooth, who cares? But um, putting aside me as an individual, it would be a very good thing if it could be set up in a way that people could trust it, um, maybe give the privacy concerns to people that, um, that people do trust, uh, independent of the government. L um, like who? Um, maybe experts. I'd be happy to give it to Simon to look after, for example. <laughs> I reckon he'd do a great job. There's, um, there's, a great, there's a great Islamic <laughs> saying, trust in God, but tie the camel's leg. <laughs> I, 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 think that, I think that governments, I think, all around the country are progressively earning more trust uh, because of the way they've been responding. But I think we are right to be sceptical and I believe that we should, for example, be ensuring that not only... The more, the more we hear about this app, the less alarming it seems, but put in place the legislation, which I know the government is thinking of, to give an absolutely fixed sunset yeah. clause. Make sure that it can only be used for the specific purpose for which it's been provided and not repurposed for any other things. And I think the more that the government offers that up as the way that they're going to manage that, the better it will be. And we've actually been seeing this, I think, too, that the government... This is great to see politicians changing course and adjusting in response to new facts and information and not being suddenly saying, oh, I got you, you know, it's flip-flop or something like that. This is the way government should operate. It should be rational, it should respond to new evidence, but it should take its responsibility to offer the solutions which it could reasonably anticipate. And I think if it does that, then this should be something which people will adopt. Jodie McVernon, do you need these apps in order to ensure that the curve continues to go in the direction you want it to, or can you do it without the apps? So the fundamental thing that is required to keep this epidemic under control is the public health contact tracing effort, and that will main, remain the, the remit of public health units and people. It's about people just, you know, having conversations and identifying these contacts. And really what we'd hope the app can do is 
be an adjunct to that process. All of us come into contact with people who are familiar strangers, um, particularly as we liberalise society and people are moving more, it's likely that the number of contacts that individuals make will increase. So this is really to augment the existing public health activity that exists, to try to um, reduce the spread of infection, to identify close contacts and to, to encourage those people to go into quarantine. So really it's there as a, an addition and we need to evaluate how effective it will be. Part right. of that will be how many people take it up and part of it will be how many contacts we end up finding in addition who become infected. That, uh, that needs to be part of the process. And, and from your point of view, do we only need the 40% of the population or does it actually need to be much more than that? Look, I think there's probably a minimum threshold, but above that, the more the, more the better. And, and then, as I say, it's a process of working out, well, of the additional people we found, how many more infections did we, did we actually manage to, to isolate? All right, our next question tonight comes from Luke Reeves in Cremorne, New South Wales. So every parent knows that kids bring home all sorts of colds and other bugs from school and daycare. I haven't found any scientific publication showing children cannot be vectors for the novel coronavirus. With the vast majority of countries around the world having closed their schools during this outbreak, the federal government is trying to keep our schools open, despite contradictory messages from most state premiers. What does the panel think of this, and what is the scientific basis for this decision? Let me put that to you, Jody McVernon. So I'm a parent and I know all about the infectious agents in our households. And really, for most infectious diseases, children are the most effective vectors that we have. And for influenza, we know that they're very important drivers of influenza transmission. And the thing that's been absolutely notable about this virus from the beginning is the absence of outbreaks in schools. We see plenty of outbreaks in social settings of adults, in aged care homes, in other closed populations, but we just simply have not seen them in, in children. And there have been investigations in schools in Australia to try to find secondary cases where cases have been found, and we're really looking forward to seeing the results of those. But this, this virus behaves differently. And even if children do get the virus, we know that they're very unlikely to have severe disease. So in thinking about how to safely open up society and thinking about what is essential in our society, we believe very strongly that education is essential. We know that many schools are valiantly delivering education online, but it's not the same as being in the classroom with a teacher, and that is what our children need. And if they are themselves not at risk and we see that they don't seem to spread infection well amongst themselves or to others, then that seems to be a really um, risk, a proportionate risk-based way of considering, you know, what, what parts of our society should be opened up first. Well, what about the teachers? That's the other part yeah. of that. Um, on one hand, they've been told, well, we've been told that the kids are, can't be with their grandkids because they might spread it, but yet it's OK to be around teachers. And so I think that bit of confusing yeah. information is... Um, is causing stress for a whole lot of teachers, so not getting clear information yeah. on that. Um, and so we've got to also think about the health of the adults that are in those schools, schools at that time too. And I know many states have in implemented um, social distancing and allowing that to happen in the schools, and that's a good thing, but that's still not worked out across the country. I think this opens up a really interesting question about this, which we haven't talked about as much as we should. Uh, and that is the choices that some people make in their workplaces, whether it's healthcare workers or potentially teachers, to voluntarily take on the burden of that risk. Mm -hmm. Now, I think the corresponding part of that is that if you're a teacher who is concerned, you should be able to have a conscientious objection to putting yourself at risk in that environment. There should you should be no... do so in full knowledge of what the yeah, facts Yeah, absolutely. Are. So, the, uh, mm -hmm. so I think getting very clear about whether children can transmit it and, mm -hmm. and what the risks are. But I think there's a whole lot of people, and this has been remarkable, who uh, in aged care, in health care, in education, have known what the risks are and have nonetheless said, I'm willing to take that on in order to serve the community. That's absolutely and right. I mean, and this is actually the kind of thing we have seen in war times in the past, right? The strongest, youngest, ablest members of the community volunteering to take on a risk. But Dan Andrews, the Victorian Premier, says that in his view, uh, telling children to go to school and communities to support that act is inconsistent with the other message, which is stay at home. 
Well, it is because, you know, stay at home is uh, a very restrictive order. And he is, of course, I would think, trying to address the more vulnerable elements of the population, mainly with that stay at home order. So look at the facts. The facts are, as we have presented here, that the children and the younger people are simply not as at risk of serious symptoms and serious disease. And don't forget, we are making progress on treatments as well. So even the fatality rate that we see now is likely to go down when we have, you know, proning and remdesivir and, you know, these other promising treatments, which are going to make this much more like the flu in terms of the case fatality rate than it already is. I want to put a web question to you uh, that's not via video. Uh, and, Neb Power, if I could ask you to address this. It's from Kylie Johnson in Adelaide. She says, why won't the government help Virgin Airlines? Hmm. Well, this is uh, very topical at the moment. And uh, I think the key thing here is that Australia needs a strong, vibrant aviation industry because a lot of our population centres are separated by great distance. So it's critically important for us that we have a competitive aviation industry so that we get the best service at the best price that we can. And that means we need more than one airline. The ways that we get that and the details of how that can, needs to be worked out, I guess, needs to be further worked through to understand what all of the implications of that are, and that's on ongoing right at the moment. So sure, but uh, I, let's just get specific about this, though, because Virgin Australia is expected to go into voluntary administration. Uh, the Commission that you lead had promised to be a bridge between public and private, uh, to break bottlenecks, to use your connections, to ensure that when there are difficult moments, we can push through them. What are you doing? So voluntary administration allows companies to buy time to look at restructuring their business so that they can trade out of it. And there's been a lot of work going on behind the scenes to understand the issues, the specific issues that are facing Virgin and, for that matter, all the airlines, and to work out what's the best approach to that. So those discussions are ongoing at the moment and I think if Virgin but buy themselves the some time... is the Commission playing a, a role here, though? Yes, we are. And our role, don't forget, is to advise government. We're not the decision makers in this, so our role is to... Uh, uh, provide broad business input and uh, advice into government on what our views and concerns might be and how we think that barriers and enablers can be developed in the economy to accelerate the regrowth of the economy and to minimise the impact going in. So yes. there's a lot of uh, discussion going on. I think everyone's had a pretty fair input into this debate and ultimately it's going to come down to the government's ability to help a public listed company and what the appropriate measures are there. Well, that's right. And there's 16,000 workers who'd probably be feeling pretty um, crappy tonight um, and their families who'd be worried about what's going on. It's 10,000 direct uh, Virgin employees and 6,000 connected to it. Now, why shouldn't our government buy a stake in Virgin? Why shouldn't we have a stake in one of our airlines? It, uh, a whole lot of regional areas absolutely depend now on Virgin. But let's be clear, this government, to be fair, has yep. said many times it's not in the business of nationalising airlines. Well, what they've said is they're not in the business of picking winners and they don't want to interfere in the market. But the market stopped. It's been shut. All the airlines have had to be grounded, not because of some market failure or business mm. decisions. It's been because of the pandemic. So there's a good reason to suspend these normal orthodoxies that the government would have um, to intervene. And then later on, if they want, they can sell their equity in the, in the airline. It doesn't mean they're there forever if they don't want to be there forever. So this is like what the UK did with the banks during the global financial crisis, some of it. Well, many um, uh, countries have done this with airlines because, like Air New Zealand, for example, they can see if you're an island, it's pretty important that you've got an airline. Um, many other countries have done the same. Actually, most are partly owned by their own governments. So... The idea of buying equity into uh, the airline is what is actually needed now to save it. Gigi Foster, there has been a lot of discussion about whether Virgin was being well run. Mm -hmm. Would this be a good investment for the Australian taxpayer <laughs> at this point in time? Look, I do agree uh, with a lot of what Sally is saying in terms of uh, the importance of airlines. They run on very, very thin margins and you want to have competition in that space. As an economist, that's one of the things I would emphasise. If we only have one single national airline, that's not that, not that good for consumers. Um, so I, I don't think anybody disagrees that we shouldn't 
have two airlines. It's a matter of how we sustain that. And uh, let's not forget that Virgin has some very powerful uh, major shareholders that can also be contributing to this. It's not just down to government. And I think under the right conditions, then Virgin can be uh, maintained and, and kept as a second airline in Australia. But so when are we going I don't to think it's... To start I don't think back. it's fully played out yet. When, when are people going to start being able to fly back into this country? When is the business going to pick up? When are we going to allow the economy to start inching towards a recovery? I think that's a very different issue and international travel is obviously going to be determined not only on what's happening in Australia but what's happening in other countries. What will recover more quickly, I believe, is domestic air travel and we need to make sure that we have two competitive airlines, at least in Australia, to make sure that we've got the right aviation structure. All right, our next question tonight comes from Girida Mamulapali in Taylors Hill, Victoria. Good evening, panellists. If this crisis has taught us something, we now know that when pushed to the corner, we find the money to fund the unending stimulus packages uh, to save the economy. Why doesn't the government show the same vision and leadership in making the country into a manufacturing powerhouse like Germany so that we are less reliant on other countries? Nev Power. <laughs> I think that's uh, very well said and that's one of the things that we're going to be looking at. Um, but I want to stress that we're not talking about a return to mass production lines of the 1950s. We need to be reconfiguring our manufacturing to be modern, high-tech, flexible manufacturing systems that can operate in niche markets like ours. Uh, secondly, they can be manufacturing that is um, low, uh, high energy intensive major manufacturing efforts like fertilisers and petrochemicals and we're thinking very seriously about how we can provide that low energy input and I think finally we can look at value added in our, our food exports to make sure that we're adding greater value in Australia before those exports. So that is under key consideration and one of the platforms that we're thinking about as a commission that would be to help accelerate the economy. Can I ask though specifically what does that look like? <laughs> I mean I've heard the mention of petrochemicals before but I mean what are we talking about in terms of this sophisticated manufacturing model that Australia is going to move to? Where are these uh, bases going to be? Where are the jobs going to be? May not be jobs, that's the point. I mean I think if you think today sophisticated manufacturing you're probably talking about talk very, very complex robots. You're talking about, you're talking about high tech manufacturing. It's effectively robots, export, expert systems, and things like that. And one of the really fascinating things about what we're going through at the moment is that people were already predicting that within five to ten years you'd start to see a decline in employment in a range of different areas brought upon because of mm. robotics, expert systems, and things like that. And what's happened is we're living it now, ten years earlier than we thought, with this great mm. shock. And I think there will be manufacturing. I mean, there are places like here in Western Sydney, Rode microphones that make some of the best audio equipment in the world. It's precision manufacturing and there'll be other things but I think we have to also accept that it probably isn't going to be a great generator of jobs and that's precisely why the economics of this are so important because what kind of economy will we have if it's not, you know, taxes aren't going to come from PAYE, it's going <laughs> to be other things. These are massive questions we have to think about. And we've been given a chance now to begin doing mm. so because of this environment. It's also about what type of jobs, and I think it's sort of what Nev was saying, it won't be 1950s, big production lines, you know, thousands and thousands of workers all in one place. Yes, there might be less workers, but um, highly skilled jobs, better paid jobs, hopefully secure jobs, uh, this is the type of jobs that uh, create or lead to or make a country more able to innovate and to be able to um, change. And if we're thinking also that, that our economy will need to change in the future towards renewable energy, having that type of skills base and that capacity will be really critical to well, us. Well, I do as a think that it's important that it will be fewer of those. I don't think it's going to be a massive creator of employment. And therefore, we have to ask these very fundamental questions which are being brought into sharp focus at the moment about what becomes a tax base and how you sustain that in the future. What becomes a meaningful life if it's not attached to a specific job? And there are plenty of historical antecedents of this, including in this own country when people, you know, before European um, colonists arrived, they were rich and meaningful lives, but they weren't with the job in the sense that we had it. So that's why I think, you know, it's terrible that we're going through it at the moment, but it is a 
it's an extraordinary opportunity to start thinking about these things. Well, I think our next questioner is thinking in oh. that territory. His name is Jeremy Abdul Karim. He's in Bayswater, WA. With all this talk about reopening the economy, can we just take a breath, take a break and just think about how we're going to use this once in a generation time to talk about how we even want our economy to be? how we want our education, our employment, our childcare, our hospitals, even the environment to be, and use that discussion to help us into the future? Yeah. Fabulous, fabulous question. And yeah. I think you're, you know, many of the comments have pointed in this direction. It's a chance for Australia to develop an industrial policy for this generation. And, and we can move in the direction that we think is, is going to be consistent with the country's comparative advantages. And, for example, solar voltaics is one example, right? We have so much sun. Why are we not pouring more research and development and, and jobs into that sector and make a green energy future? Why don't we do more in terms of, you know, teaching and nursing and all these other kinds of, you know, supposedly uh, scarce occupations? And the government is moving in this direction a bit. So the higher education package that was passed recently is putting up diplomas in those kinds of areas, IT, healthcare, nursing, uh, teaching, and that is going to help some of the young people who will have been displaced and is also starting to move in the direction of reconfiguring the industrial mix. You mentioned something though that we've had people writing to us for weeks about which is can we use this moment to transition to a green energy future and a lot of people referring to Ross Garno's book talking about uh, Australia becoming a hydrogen superpower. Mm. I mean is that the sort of thing that could be used to get us out of this moment. Sure, look at historical examples. Think of the, the New Deal in, the, in America, right? The Hoover Dam was made, right? So much infrastructure was built. Some of it hasn't been replaced since then. And, and this is exactly the sort of moment when we need to deliver fiscal stimulus anyway. So let's find ways to deliver it in, in, in positive directions for the future of the country. And that's the intergenerational payback that Sally was talking about at the very beginning of the program where you do invest in things that can be sustained and provide a rich and, I'd say, meaningful way of life for Australians in the future. Now, Power, are you considering those sorts of things? Yes, absolutely. And those are very much on the agenda to talk about how we can develop our economy, how we can grow our economy by not uh, trying to replicate the past, but how do we modernise it, how do we grow it, and how do we accelerate those sectors and those industries that can give us the greatest benefits in the shortest possible time? So can, can, can we nail down some specifics, though, please, Nev? Sure. Um, I mentioned before about manufacturing. So one of the keys to getting our industries competitive is to have competitive energy supply. So right now we have an opportunity to get low-cost gas into our markets and make sure that we can then generate low-cost electricity and that will kickstart a lot of manufacturing that we currently import. For example, we import fertilisers from overseas. And we put, imported it from overseas because they've got lower energy costs than what we have. Yet Australia has a huge abundance of energy of all forms. And of all the countries in the world, we should have competitive, sustainable energy supply here and be able to use that to kickstart a lot of those industries. I think another change that's happened is this idea of value and who do we value in society and who don't we? And all of a sudden, all these workers who are unseen, unspoken about, mm. not respected, are essential workers. So you've got um, people who um, look after your sewage systems, you, people obviously in your supermarkets, people who are disability care workers, obviously nurses and teachers, and all of a sudden, workers are at the front. And I've sort of seen a lot of pride coming from a lot of those workers just with the label essential. Like when it came down to it, actually we didn't need the bankers and the, hmm. you know, the, the hedge fund managers <laughs> and all of those people. Who we really needed were basically people in the supermarkets keeping things running. Mm -hmm. Our next question tonight comes from Andrew Tenson in South Morang, Victoria. My question is for Sally. Sally, what can be done to support the everyday Australian worker that is a casual that was working 12 months or longer prior to the 1st of the 3rd, 2020? who has an employer that simply won't put them back on the books. This is the case for my wife, who was a hairdresser for over four years at the same place. Is entitled to the JobKeeper payment in every way, but can't access that payment because her employer, who is intending to register for the scheme, won't simply put her back on the books. Won't allow her to try and help support our young family. What is being done to help Australians who find themselves in this same situation as my wife? Thank you. 
So um, two parts to that. Um, first of all, casual workers. So um, Andrew's uh, partner has been in a job for four years as a casual worker. Well, how do we get to a position in our country where actually permanent jobs are called casual? And it's got out of control, got completely out of control. The fact the government can't design a um, job keeper to, to catch everyone um, shows that. There's all these people in arts and entertainment that have lost their jobs because their shows have shut down and they've got nothing whatsoever. In the case of um, um, your partner who, whose employer is refusing to take on JobKeeper, I'd say two things. First of all, I think it's immoral for employers to just refuse to put people on JobKeeper. It, and some of them are saying, oh, what are they going to do? Just sit at home, do nothing, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the loyalty you will get from em employees for doing that. And, mm. and what's it for you? Mm. Like to fill in some paperwork. Mm. And what if they're staying at home? So what? Actually, that's good. That's good for all of us at the moment, but you can actually ask them to work. So on one hand, we've been asked to step up. Healthcare workers have been asked to put themselves on the line. A whole lot of other workers are out there doing what we're doing. We're putting is, aside is there politics. Is a mechanism, though, that could be put in place to, to ensure that someone in this circumstance actually gets what the government intends for them? The only mechanism is to organise as a group of workers and demand it, like to be in your union. Like, that's the only way. We'll make sure our members do, but it's going to be tough for a whole lot of others if an employer simply refuses to. But I reckon Australians will remember those employers who decided, well, no, I'm just going to pack up shop and too bad about my employees. I like... think there's a, there's a deep dilemma in this uh, whole response to what we're going through. If you think about what has got us to the point where the curve is flattening and we're talking about some prospective emergence from all of this. Yes, there's been good leadership from government and people like Sally and others, but the actual solution has come from every single Australian agreeing to play their part as an individual, to stay inside, to maintain physical distancing, to exercise discipline. And if, if, if the whole nation has been held to account and been told by our leaders, you must be responsible, you must solve it, then it's really hard to explain why some people have been, in a sense, quarantined from the support that others have got. Mm. And I think this is, it's, it's a terrible ethical dilemma at the heart of the current policy settings as to how we're all supposed to solve the problem, but only some of us are supposed mm. to be helped in the, in the process. And I'm not sure how governments work through that, even if they're really aware, perhaps, of the of the asymmetry in that position. Well, I think one of the problems is the complexity of delivering the aid, right? If, if we had, and I've said this elsewhere, if we had something like a national bank, an actual national bank in which everybody had an account and the government was in crisis as it is now, it could deliver stimulus by simply writing checks to people's accounts, right? Just give a, a balance to everyone. And that's a much more efficient mechanism than having to go through this sort of operational thing of the employer-employee relationship, and then if you satisfy these conditions, then X. Uh, and, and just writing checks to people, we've done that before. We've seen it in the 2007-2008 crisis. It's a lot easier to do that more quickly and more in a more targeted fashion if you have a mechanism. Now, uh, with Anzac Day approaching this week, we thought we'd seek at this point in the program some perspective from someone who's lived through this sort of crisis and, in fact, much worse before. 95-year-old Jim Kerr spent years working on the infamous Thai Burma Railway as a prisoner of war. I caught up with Jim earlier. Mm. Jim, it's great to talk to you again. Uh, thanks for being on the show tonight. How are you coping with isolation at the moment? Uh, I'd say the main thing I'm missing is family, not being able to visit family and also not having them come to visit me. Jim, we're obviously coming into Anzac Day this week and I wonder whether there are lessons that you took with you from the prisoner of war camps that you are still using today in isolation. I am because nothing with what I've got left of my lifetime could compare anywhere near what we went through, those of us that worked on the Thai Burma Railway. I mean, that was sheer hell. We always kept our morale up. We never, ever lost our spirit. And if ever I was proud to be an Australian, it was as an Australian prisoner of war. So how do you compare the restrictions that we're living through right now with the sorts of restrictions that you've experienced in your lifetime? I grew up in the Great Depression. And what I remember of the Great Depression is going to school and, and telling them that I couldn't uh, pay for my school books. Uh, I can remember going to the cake shop, asking did they have any stale cakes. 
We didn't have running hot water. Never knew what running hot water was until I joined the army. So I have lived through times where I know how life can be very, very hard. We're going through some trying times at the moment and this is just testing everybody's, everybody's mettle now on whether they're going to either stand or fall by the wayside. Jim, I'm interested to hear from your perspective how you think Australians are coping in this time of crisis. A toilet paper issue, I, I can't get over it, honestly. I really can't. If that's what people have come to, that they sink to that level to fight over a packet of toilet rolls, for God's sake, let's get real. Jim, during your time detained, you obviously found strengths and qualities within yourself that, that maybe you didn't know you had. What do you say to the Australian public for this moment? What do we need to look for in ourselves? Well, I think it's Australian mateship, the way we have always pulled together. Uh, Australians, uh, we're renowned for it. Everything I've got, I don't take it for granted. I appreciate very, very much what I've had in life, but I never forget why um, and how this all came about. We, we went to war and we fought for that, that, uh, that word again, freedom, freedom. Jim, it's been terrific to catch up with you. Please take care of yourself uh, and I look forward to catching up with you next year. Yeah, thanks, Hamish. Simon, there's been a lot of comparisons about then and, and now. I mean, hearing from Jim, it, it really does put things into perspective. Is it? What a great bloke to hear from. Look, I've had the privilege of um, having Hellfire Pass opened up early one morning and myself and just one Air Force officer walked through the mists in the cool and there's an audio accompaniment. And two of the voices that leapt out as I listened to it over this couple of kilometres, all shaped by prisoners of war and slave labour. One was Sir John Carrick, who was one of the founders of the Liberal Party, and the other one was Tom Uren, one of the great heroes of the, the Labor Party and the left. And hearing them both in my ears talking, it, it made me realise that that generation, people like him, had, had had this formative experience where they'd been stripped back to know what was really important, the essential humanity. And somewhere along the line in all of the time of plenty that we've enjoyed, I think we've lost some of that now. Our politics became more about the machine and our markets and things, they forgot the purpose for which they originally created and look at Adam Smith, you know, to increase the stock of common goods. So many things have been forgotten. So I think to hear a man like that remind us and to say that there does need to be some kind of a glue which unites us all together, particularly at a time like this. And there's been some terrible things I've seen, for example, Asian Australian people being abused just because of the way they look when the virus doesn't care about, you know, their family history. There are other Australians, they're, they're bearing the same burden. He would never have put up with that. And I think that we've got to rediscover, and maybe we will in this moment, rediscover some of those virtues of that older generation and things will matter more because of what we've been through. The other thing was, is uh, what did he say mattered when everything else was stripped Freedom. back? And Freedom, mateship. Mateship. Yeah. mateship. It was his mates and sticking together and supporting each other. Yeah. All right, the next question tonight is from Sue Langford in Runniford, New South Wales. Since the common cold is a type of coronavirus and no vaccine is available for the common cold, how can we be confident a vaccine will be effective for COVID-19? Also, since viruses mutate, if a vaccine does become available, is it likely the COVID-19 vaccine would become an annual requirement like the flu vaccine? Jodie McVernon. Look, it's an excellent question and obviously all of us are very, very hopeful that a vaccine would become available because that really would be a definitive solution for our societies and the way that we would learn to live with and adapt to this vaccine. But it isn't a guarantee and I'm concerned that there's a, a dogma out there of when we have a vaccine in 12 to 18 months and there, there are no certainties here. 
And that's why, really, this needs to be a much more nuanced discussion about how we, as a global community, learn to live with this new virus, how we adapt to it over time, how we mitigate its risks and harms, how we keep looking for new therapies and, and other treatments that might reduce the death toll, as been talked about already tonight, um, and hoping for a vaccine, but aware that it may not come. And jo so Jody, what, that what, is important. What was the experience mm. with polio? Well, polio was many, many years. I mean, the polio pandemics that, that were the scourge of, of many Western nations over the first half of the 20th century, there were, you know, annual outbreaks and school closures and, and great fear um, of this, this terrible disease that, that, you know, killed many and left others in iron lungs for many years. Um, it was the first great global race for a vaccine, um, which, which produced two, an injected vaccine and an oral polio vaccine. And still, we are tantalisingly close to eliminating polio. I'm very disappointed that it's, it's likely that in the, in the time of COVID that, that our global vaccine programs will also suffer and that, that that elimination journey might also be limited. But we've had to live with and adapt to these sorts of challenges before and, and keep working with our medical technologies. But this could be a long journey and that's what we really need to have a whole of society complex conversation about of how we continue to adapt to that. Uh, Neb Power, if suppression is our aim in Australia, not elimination and if we don't get a vaccine, are we going to be living with some kind of restriction on our way of life actually for years? I think this is an important question for all of us and uh, one of the things that we need to do is to find ways to work with and around having COVID in the background. For example, we can introduce physical distancing and protection systems into our workplaces to protect our, our employees and our customers and make sure that we've got a rapid response in the event that we do get outbreaks and that we've got a very safe and sure ways of returning workplaces and shop fronts and so on back to being safe places for us. So I think that we can do a lot to live with the virus as we go through that phase of having it in the background, either here in Australia or overseas, so that we can protect ourselves. It does mean making changes and changes to the way we live at the moment, but I think that's doable in exactly the same way that we had to live with polio and we had to live with other viruses in the past. We can do that. A, a quick final word to you, Gigi Foster. So here's a very extreme point of view. Perhaps the best thing for Australia you can't end to do. The show like that. <laughs> <laughs> Because I can. Um, what if herd immunity, the development of, of sort of a, a robust system of defence via the exposure of many, many people to this virus happens to be the best way, the safest way to protect the elderly and other people in our society? I wonder if there is never a vaccine, is it not living with the virus, basically saying that we would like to have the best defence possible, which means the best immunological defence, which may mean the highest number of infections. I'm just going to grab another 30 seconds to let Jodie McVernon respond to that. Well, clearly, the herd immunity strategy has become a let-it-rip strategy, which is clearly not going to be our policy. Um, herd immunity is the way of achieving a long-term level of protection in society by vaccine or by infection. But we also don't know for certain whether a single exposure to this virus is enough to induce long-term or lifelong immunity. And I, I think that strategy is extremely risky and could cost us dearly with very limited returns. So I think we need to understand much more about the biology of the virus before we would feel that that was um, a safe outcome, even given the undesirable path to getting there. Right. Do you want to give us a very quick final word? We've grabbed an extra minute. I, I, look, I, I think uh, what I'm worried about in, in, in this... I mean, I think it may be over time through children mixing together, it will progressively over generations take place. I think the more immediate kind of concern we've got to think about right now, though, is around some of the mental health issues, particularly caused by moral injury, which is where people suddenly make decisions under pressure and later regret it and that we should be thinking too about how we provide support for people so that we can stop that and the mental health issues that would subsequently emerge. Well, a huge thanks to our panel for all of your time tonight. Uh, Sally McManus, Neb Power, Gigi Foster, Jodie McVernon and Simon Lang Longstaff.
And thank you at home for sending in your video questions. We really love seeing where you are right across the country. Please join us next week for an in-depth look at the way our education system is being disrupted by COVID-19. I know there's lots of families that need us to have that discussion, want that discussion. Joining me, the head of the New South Wales Department of Education, Mark Scott, Sydney University Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Lisa Jackson-Pulver, and the Federal Education Minister, Dan Tian, will be here to answer some of your questions as well. Take care, stay safe, watch your hands, Wash your hands and stay at home if you can. A very good night.